In the last video, I explained the problems of sourcing chips for use in the DIY BMS controller and modules. I also showed a newer revision of the controller PCB, which has fewer components and hopefully is easier and actually possible to build. Since that video, I've had the bare PCB boards made and I've manually soldered the parts on. And here it is, in a rather fetching purple colour. As this is a prototype board, I've not put all the relays on, but I have tested them and they all work fine. With such a significant change to the hardware, this also meant the software needed modifications as well. So over the past two months, I've undertaken a substantial update and rewrite to a large part of the controller code. I've not done this completely on my own though, so I'd like to say thank you to these two for the assistance with code writing and testing. So if you are already a DIY BMS user, should you get rush out and uh, build one of these new boards? Well, probably not. There's no real benefit if you already have a working system. The circuit design has changed a little, but fundamentally it's working as before. This also means that I now have more controller boards than I need. So I'm going to give away one of the older style boards fully assembled to one of you lucky viewers. More details on that later in the video. So let's take a look at the differences between the original controller hardware and this version. The first obvious change is the removal of two chips, which are now merged into a single device. This is a TCA6416. This means less parts, parts to source and also less soldering. The second obvious change is the addition of two buttons on the right hand side. This was a request from users who have put the controller inside a case, so it could no longer touch the screen. Some users also bought a TFT without the touch interface chip, so at long last you can now use that correctly. The buttons are configured to switch on the display and move left and right through the information pages. Existing users may notice that there is now an extra page showing the controller statistics like uptime, number of packets received and various error counters. These are the same values that you normally see in the web interface. I've also enabled the touch screen to be used to scroll through the pages. Simply touch the left or right sides of the screen to move forwards and backwards. This also works if you have the existing controller board. After about 30 seconds, the screen switches off to save power. You'll also notice that my TFT screen has an SD card slot on the back of it. This is electrically wired to the same card slot on the controller board. So you can use either of those depending on your needs, but don't use both of them at the same time. The third change to the controller is a little harder to, to spot but was an improvement suggested by the Open Energy Monitor forum users. This introduces an N-channel MOSFET on the received communication line. Users have found that this significantly reduces interference in electrically noisy environments, and therefore reduces communication issues and corrupts or lost packets of data. There's also been some general tidying up of the silk screen and alignment of parts, but those don't change the functionality of the board. So let's jump over to the software side of things. I mentioned that I'd spent a lot of time rewriting parts of the controller code. The aim of the rewrite was to reduce the usage of Arduino style libraries and replace them with the native ESP32 ones from the IDF software development kit. So you could ask, why do I want to do this? Well, having all these software layers makes the code larger and adds complexity. So trying to get back to the native IDF libraries means I can then use the native hardware correctly without it being hidden behind the Arduino framework. I've not managed to completely remove the Arduino framework yet, but that's the eventual goal. You can see on the diagram that I've significantly reduced the number of third-party libraries used by the project. Most of this change was driven by the lack of free memory in the ESP32. If we look at the About page, you can see the amount of free memory the ESP currently has. On the existing code, we only have about 35 kilobytes remaining. However, looking at the latest version, we now have around 90 kilobytes remaining. In a similar fashion, the actual size of the comp compile code was also shrunk by about 
The other substantial improvement comes from the using the newer IDF framework. This has really improved the reliability of the controller, especially around the Wi-Fi network. I'm now going to show you the process of how to upgrade the controller to the latest version in five steps. On the existing controller, click Save Configuration and Save Wi-Fi. These are on the storage page. These options will only work if you have a memory card inserted into, into the controller. If you are installing a brand new controller, you obviously won't be able to do this step. Download the latest controller code from the releases section on GitHub. It will be the file with a name which starts with compiled underscore firmware, followed by the date and time. All these upgrade steps I'm explaining are also in the GitHub documentation in the how to use the code section. If we open up the zip file, you can extract the controller firmware, ESP32 controller firmware complete.bin. Make sure the ESP32 is connected to your computer using a USB cable. I'm going to use the Node MCU tool to send the firmware to the, to the controller. If you are not using Windows or a Mac, you can use the native ESP tool Python scripts, but you'll have to Google for instructions on how that works. So you want to select the fastest baud rate you can. Um, you can pick a slower one if the programming fails. I'm also going to select dual I.O. for flash mode. Yes to erase the flash memory. And then I'm going to click flash node MCU and wait a little while. So after a few seconds, you should see a success message. Reset the ESP32 using the button marked EN, but leave it connected to the computer for now. After the upgrade, all the settings on the controller are wiped out and reset to factory defaults. Hopefully you are using a memory card, so we can now restore those settings and get it back up and running quickly. When the controller powers up, it will automatically look on the memory card for a file with the Wi-Fi settings in it. If these are found, it will automatically configure itself and join the network. You can see on the TFT screen if it has joined the network, network successfully, along with its IP address. If this fails, or if you don't have a memory card, or you might be programming this controller for the very first time, you will need to manually configure the Wi-Fi settings. In previous versions of the software, the controller would have started up a Wi-Fi access point, which you join using a mobile phone or computer, and then configure using a web interface. I often found this to be a very long-winded process. Quite often, Android phones wouldn't work correctly because they, they couldn't get to the internet properly. So from this version forward, I've made the serial console the only way to manually configure the Wi-Fi. You already have the ESP32 connected to the computer. So here I'm using Putty on Windows uh, to open the relevant serial port. You can see the serial connection parameters I'm using to, to, to connect to it on the screen. If we reboot the th ESP32, you can see that it will wait on boot up for you to press the spacebar to begin manual configuration. You have about five seconds to do this. A scan of local Wi-Fi access points will be made, and then you will need to enter the corresponding number of the access point to connect to, followed by the password for this access point. After 10 seconds, the controller reboots and hopefully connects to the Wi-Fi access point you have specified. If it doesn't connect, repeat this configuration process and double check the password and also the signal strength of the access point you're trying to connect to. So now we have the controller up and running, connected to the access point and hopefully to the internet. If this is the first time you've installed the controller firmware, you can now go ahead and configure the BMS. If you're upgrading, you can now go to the storage page and select a configuration file to restore. You need to accept the confirmation and wait for the success message to appear. The configuration files do not store the passwords for the MQTT servers, so you'll need to manually configure those if you're using MQTT. And don't forget to click the Save button. Although not essential, I recommend rebooting the, the controller at this point um, and then going through each of the settings to ensure the configuration is exactly as you want it. And that's the upgrade complete. Functionality of the web interface is largely the same as before. Nearly all the changes are actually hidden under the covers, although you might find the interface is more responsive and quicker to respond. The only significant improvement is the configuration restore functionality we have just used during the up upgrade. And hopefully this makes future upgrades much easier. If you run into web page errors when you first load the updated controller web interface, clear out the cookies in your browser. 
The web page security used by the controller has changed slightly and old cookies may cause trouble. I mentioned at the start of this video that I have a spare controller PCB um, that I'm going to give away to one of my viewers. So if you want to be in with a chance to receive this controller, here's what you need to do. First of all, leave a comment on this video. Secondly, make sure you've subscribed to the channel if you haven't already. And just so you know, YouTube doesn't sponsor this giveaway and isn't liable for it. Full terms and conditions are in the video description. And that's it for another video. As always, thank you for the support and for watching. Help and assistance with the DIY BMS project can be found on GitHub and also on the Open Energy Monitor Forum. See you next time.